Esta semana, Vice News presenta Afganistán después de la guerra. Vemos el resurgimiento y fortalecimiento de grupos talibanes tras la partida de las Fuerzas Armadas Occidentales. Y después, los traductores que trabajaron junto con las fuerzas estadounidenses y de la OTAN en su lucha contra el Talibán fueron abandonados a enfrentar su propio destino en Afganistán. Because of the interpreter job. If he find me, he will cut my head. Tras la salida de las Fuerzas Armadas Occidentales de Afganistán, en septiembre de 2015, el Talibán lanzó una ofensiva contra la ciudad de Kunduz que resultó en una batalla entre los militantes del Talibán y fuerzas del gobierno afgano, apoyados por ataques aéreos estadounidenses. The Afghan forces advised that they were taking fire from enemy positions and asked for air support from US forces. An airstrike was then called to eliminate the Taliban threat and several civilians were accidentally struck. Después de varios días de lucha, las fuerzas de Afganistán recuperaron la ciudad. Vice News consiguió acceso exclusivo al Talibán con los soldados que participaron en esta ofensiva y que continúan con la lucha del grupo terrorista. In late September, Afghanistan's northern provincial capital, Kunduz, became the first major city in 14 years to fall into the control of the Taliban, sparking a fierce battle between Taliban fighters and US-assisted Afghan forces. Vice News gained exclusive access to a group of local Taliban fighters who had fought in the battle for Kunduz to find out how only two years after the U.S. declared victory in Afghanistan, the Taliban were able to retake the country's fifth largest city in just a few days. Before meeting with the Taliban, we traveled to Kunduz to speak with government forces. Not so long ago, during the fighting, the Taliban were spreading pictures of themselves raising their white flag in the middle of the town square right here. But as you can see, the flag has been replaced by the Afghan national flag now. Throughout the efforts to take back Kunduz, the U.S. military supported Afghan forces with airstrikes. One of these airstrikes hit an MSF facility in an overnight attack. In early November, MSF released the initial review of that night's events and confirmed that the attack killed at least 30 people, including 13 MSF staff. President Obama has since apologized for the attack. <laughs> Afghanistan 
ولایت قندوز گرفت قماندانی در نفشان بود ولایت گرفت تمام قطعات نظامی به حساب بست به حساب دفتر دیوان قندوز مکمل گرفتن اجازه او دشمن شکست خورده دشمن بسیار مورال ضعیف داشت و دیگه مقامت که در بل مقابل نیروهای دولتی نمیتونه دیگه ای رای به مردم افغانستان میتیم که ما از تایق قطر خون خود از وجب وجب وطن از وجب وجب خاک خود دفاع میکنیم دفاع کردیم و دفاع خواهیم کرد The Afghan forces were defiant and seemed to dismiss the idea that the Taliban were a real threat to the stability of the region I'm heading towards Chardara now. It's a Taliban stronghold. I'm going to be picked up by Taliban fighters there, and I hope to get embedded with them. Oh. Gunshots have been fired in there. Huh? There's some Talibs in front of us. We don't have an agreement, so I'm going to switch off the camera. Clearly, this place is controlled by the Taliban. Since we actually arrived, we've only seen their flags, the white flag. I haven't seen any government flags in this area so far. In order to gain access to the local Taliban unit, we were taken to a safe house where we waited for their commander to grant us permission to film. <laughs> تاد جهاد مزن ده دغه شان ته جهاد هم ده یو سره د جهاد نه د زده کړه په جهاد باندې نه پوهیږي بس چا ورته ویل چې ټوپک را واخله او بس دې کډزې کو خلک ولا کافران ولا دا جهاد ده نه دا جهاد نه ده اولی پس ازو امریکا رفت ازو بود پولیس محلی بنای پولیس محلی اربکی را ساختن کی مردوم فاسق بودن بسیار مردوم بدکار و بچباز مردوم بودن بسیار مردوم ظلم میکردن اگامی منطقه ما بود ای آزاد شد شهر قندوز آزاد کردیم از دست کفار ای آزاد شد کابل می گیریم کابل آزاد شد تمام افغانستان می جنگیم اگر شهید شدیم شهیدم زنده است بر نزد خدا ما ان در دنیا هم کامیاب بسیم در آخرت هم شما بعضی نفرا میگه که چی میگه که که از خاطر که شما مجبور شدید میگه حکومت میگه شما مجبور شدید که فرار کنید از قندوز نه، الحمدلله ما مجبور نشدیم، لیکن وقتی که شهر ما گرفتیم، پانزده روز ما تیر کردیم دشار. او ما برد بگویم که ما با خاطر مشکلات مردم، با این خاطر، یعنی ما هر وقت می توانیم کندوز مکمل بگیریم، الحمدلله. For the past two years, since increased responsibility was given to the Afghan National Army, the Taliban have gained more territory. Local support for the army and national police force has significantly decreased, helping the Taliban regain influence in the region. I'm together with a group of local Taliban from Kunduz, and they're taking me to the village uh, of uh, Muhammad Jan. They uh, conquered this village approximately six months ago, and they're going to show me around. Islam غالب باشه کفر مغلوب باشه کفر جزیابتیا. بادار ما باشه ایرقم خو مسلمان زندگی کردن میتونه وقت سلام میشه که ما بادار باشیم و کوپر غلام ما باشه باعث سلام باشه دیگه سلام میشه این تو متا که آمده از طرف بعض نفرا و از اقامت که شما زلم کردن مقابل نفرایش چی است که جواب شما تو مات که شما رکت کردن جواب ما یه است که ما الحمدلله مسلمان استیم و مسلمان و مجاهد هیچ وقت نمیخواد که برای ملت مسلمان زلم بکنه سایستا اما او تا وقتی یک دروغ میگه تا وقتی میکنه دیگه یک کاری تهمت دیگه نیست دروغ میگه گونه بعد از بعد مردم پرسان کنن شما اگه میخوان که سعی کنن تشویق. The Taliban were keen to show us their popularity amongst the locals, so we were taken on a tightly controlled tour of the area. چطور است زندگی؟ شر شر ما با داغش. طالب آزار خونه میتونیم. من یک راه آزار میتونم. شما از چی میگه؟ امیدش ما چی از آینده افغانستان؟ آینده افغانستان امیدم امیدم که هر که برای خدا باشه و نمو از افغانستان است و زندگیش هم انشالله خوب میشه 
بشریت برابر باشه I'm walking around with the Taliban fighters and they're small talking with the villagers seems like it's a local movement the Taliban militia here In a nearby village we met an Afghan MSF doctor who was working at the hospital in Kunduz when it came on the fire Assalamu alaikum muhtaram you walk here چرا فکر میکنید چرا فکر میکنید که یا بمبال کردن شبخانه را به نظر شما اشتباه بود یا چی بود والا این کار که ما که چقا میرا گپ تحلیل کردیم این کار قصدن بود و مسئولین ام اس اف با ما وعده داده بودند که ام اس اف شبخانه ام اس اف بمبار نمیشه به می سب بودن ازی تمام پرسنل از کار خود راضی بودند گفت خدمت میشه با مردم خودم خدمت میکنیم به این خونه میشه که مردم طلب کرد مردم های بی غرز مردم هایی که در خدمت قرار دارن نوی بشرت تداوی میکنن بدون تویز ای تحت بمبار قرار بگیره و شهید کنه و باز بگه که ما اشتباه بود بخشش میخواییم به این بخشش بخشید ای کار بخشیدن نیست In the last two years Afghanistan has seen a sharp rise in the number of civilian deaths We went to a nearby madrasa where six months earlier a U.S. operated drone had allegedly killed one of the students. Bazi mardumi gafa chikat ki yaga wazara jor kat ki i bamara jor mekan bam saza budan. Wai khub barsha iu awazara me amniyat. Bam khis agmanu gat man de imdil ya udras usun. Bazi mardum me shak yukmat de idas nara ki aga das nara sh madrasa ma hu shaksi na bud. نیده گوشه بود این در رسیت وزارت معرف که به می دست مجاهدین رفتن محادر چی؟ این کبر بود، ظلم بود که پرسان ازی را نکردن The Taliban's takeover of Kunduz exposed shortcomings in the government's ability to maintain control over large areas of the country In October, the U.S. seemingly acknowledged this by announcing they will extend their military presence in Afghanistan The U.S. also confirmed their support to the Afghan local police, despite several reports that they may be contributing to the resurgence of the Taliban in Kunduz. Los traductores que trabajaron junto con las fuerzas estadounidenses y de la OTAN en Afganistán son de los aliados más valiosos en la guerra. Obtienen inteligencia en campo y son educadores de la cultura local para las fuerzas de Occidente. I'm facing threats not only Taliban, but my relatives, about my neighbors, about the people that are around me. Ahora, esos llamados aliados invaluables corren el riesgo de ser abandonados en su país mientras sufren de amenazas del Talibán por considerarlos traidores. We're in Kabul, coming to meet some interpreters, some of whom I've met in Helmand. I've spent weeks and months with some of these guys in, in the worst places at the worst times. They're all saying their life is now in danger. On paper, they meet all the conditions needed to be given a visa. But none of them are getting visas. No one seems to know if that's because it's just a messy bureaucracy and they're getting lost in the system somehow, or if there's been some big policy decision saying, we don't want to admit that these guys are in danger. The interpreters played an essential role during the war in Afghanistan, providing vital bridges between foreign forces and local communities, and intelligence on the Taliban. They volunteered because they believed we would defeat the Taliban and rebuild their long-suffering country, as we promised to do. We will not fulfill those promises and are now withdrawing, leaving most of the interpreters who helped us behind. And now they are being singled out as traitors and spies. Many have already been hunted and killed. I tracked down an old friend who is now in hiding. We agreed to meet in a small secluded house on the outskirts of Kabul. Hey! hey good How morning, buddy. Good to see you, buddy. Good, good to see you. Long time, no yeah. see. I spent five weeks with Sroch in southern Afghanistan in 2010. We were in Sangin, the most violent district of Afghanistan's most violent province. U.S. forces would have been lost without the help of the interpreters, who spent years on the front lines, serving each new set of troops as they rotated in and out. Can you go talk to her and just let her know that 
Yeah. I don't want the children to be scared. You know what I mean? Let's just let them know what we're going to do, okay? okay? She says, no, I don't need anything else. Just please secure my place, you know. Do not blow up, you know. I know they're, they're really sad because of every day blow up, shooting, fighting in there. It's so hard. So. This is life in Afghanistan, see. Every day, I, I saw my friends being injured and I saw their dead body, making friends and see their dead body. That was really ridiculous. I don't want to see any more my friends going to die. When you, when you first took the job as an interpreter, yeah. like, what did you think would happen when you finished? Like, how did you think it would end? Uh, first, I, I, I thought that maybe the Taliban are going to be finished and this country will be, become peaceful. But day by day, the Taliban getting in, increase and they getting powerful. Because of that, um, they're looking for me, I hear. They already killed my relatives, which work together, working with ISAF. Uh, I'm afraid of that day, which the NATO leave Afghanistan, the United States forces leave Afghanistan. It means we are done. They're going to catch me. They're going to probably cut my head off, probably. You know? Are you sorry that you chose to take a job as an interpreter? No. I'm proud that I work with the NATO and the United States forces because they done lots of good job. They came from far away to help Afghanistan, rebuild Afghanistan. Right now, I need their help and I wait for them, but I'm sure that the United States is going to help me. Shuffling between different homes within Kabul's patchwork of neighborhoods, we met with two other former interpreters who also served with US forces. Every interpreter I interviewed carried a folder of documents that they protected as if their lives depended on them. This mass of paperwork is for the Special Immigrants Visa Program, or SIV, their one and only chance to be granted safe passage to America. But even when they have everything in place, they still find themselves being rejected or just waiting in limbo for years. I'm approved from the SIV, got the passport, and everything is done. After that, they just give me this, this card. You will be not re-interviewed. You will be received in a several months your visa. And this is nine months ago, so what, what's the problem? They deny my visa. If you said to an American that you worked for the US government, provided faithful and valuable service to the US government, and is now experiencing a serious threat because of your work, Sure. I think most, especially the soldiers and Marines, would say he should get a visa. End of argument. I and my team wish to thank the individual for his service to Afghanistan, his continued support to our team, the US Army and Task Force Phoenix. That's the captain and also when I just work for him. He's really sad now. He knows the situation. I told everything about that. I work for him one year. How many of these letters have you got? Like 40. But still, they just deny my visa. That's you and Defense Secretary? Yeah, the Defense Secretary, he came, motivated all the soldiers, all the Turks, because of the hard work that they did. One of the team members walked on an ID that I was a little far from him. He died and I got injured. That injured my private part of uh, my body that I cannot have children. Now, we are living a very bad situation of life. From Kabul, I cannot go anywhere, not to south, not north, east, west, nowhere. When they, they just attacked my house, that's the proof, and also I have a lots of this, pictures. Sorry, this is bullet holes in, in your house? That was a bullet actually shot. I have the empty hole as well because of the interpreter job. If he find me, he will cut my head. Across Kabul, I met with many interpreters, all in hiding, who shared the same story. I'm facing threats not only Taliban, but my relatives, about my neighbors, about the people that are around me, living around me. The Taliban, they are telling us all the time, like, we are the United States spy. And if being accused of being an American spy weren't enough, people also think, wrongly, that the interpreters were paid well, making them targets of thieves. They treat us like we are working with the United States and 
you have a lot of money, give me the money, where is your account? But during the couple of years, the only money we gained, like it was about $15,000 or $14,000. It's not a good money for us. If you knew then what you know now, you, you wouldn't have taken the job? No. If I knew that the coalition force is leaving, I never choose this job at all. I lost my destiny. We are in prison in our own country. They have killed a lot of interpreters. Everyone knows they kill them and videotape them and put them on YouTube. The Taliban's official spokesman, Zabiullah Mujahid, agreed to an interview, but only by phone. What is the policy of the Taliban towards interpreters? The policy is that if you have a source of Afghanistan that the foreign and the military can be able to support them, to be able to translate them, to be able to help them, that Afghanistan, the people of the country, the people of the country, that the military can be able to help them. The people of the country can be able to help them. The people of the country can be able to help them. The people of the country can be able to help them. The people of the country can be able to help them. These threats are very real. No one knows how many interpreters have been killed so far, but several have been brutally murdered on camera and used for propaganda. If you don't get visas, what will you do? Borrow money, to give somebody to take myself out of here. To be smuggled out? Yeah, if I sit here, I can get killed. But you would leave your wife and children? I will, I will leave. I told my father, if you just take care of my family, and also I will move somewhere, like other an interpreter. I will just escape from this country. Many interpreters have already given up on the visa process and turned to smugglers, who can get them into mainland Europe with a fake visa. But when the price is as much as $20,000 per person, the few who manage to raise the money end up with nothing. For those who will take any way out they can get, there are cheaper but far more dangerous options. Starting in Kabul, interpreters pay smugglers to get them into Turkey. Once there, they pay an additional fee for a boat trip to Greece. From Greece, they then try to sneak into Western Europe. But many never make it that far. The journey is fraught with obstacles, and interpreters, along with thousands of other refugees, often get stuck along the way. Broke and without official documentation, they end up living in places like this city park in the center of Athens. It was here that I met another ex-interpreter who worked for the US military from 2004 to 2007. He didn't want to be identified. I find a smuggler. They said, I need $18,000. I told him, sorry, I can't find that money. He said, how much do you have right now? I told him, just $8,000. His $8,000 got him to Turkey, where he was then smuggled to Greece on a small and overloaded boat. After three months of living in the Athens park, he was told to go to Patras, where the penniless and desperate refugees go when they have no other chance of escape. Show us where you were sleeping. Not just only me, a lot of Afghan people are sleeping here. Oh, you were sleeping on, this, on yeah. this piece of wood? Yeah. And inside these small rooms. Just across the street from the shipyard was an abandoned mattress factory where hundreds of Afghan migrants used to live. We washed our clothes over here, and sometimes ourselves we washed it here. Yeah. So there's still people living here now? Yeah. Well, he said when he was here, there were 500 Afghans living here. The drop in the number of refugees living here was due to a recent government crackdown. There are lots of commandos or police attacking to make the Afghan peoples to go back. From the mattress factory, the refugees look for opportunities to hide within commercial trucks, which they hope are heading into Western Europe. Put yourself on the track. So what, you try and like hide underneath the truck? Yeah. And drive to Italy? Sometimes, sometimes on the wheels. That sounds dangerous. Yeah, it is dangerous. Too many people were dead. And the driver doesn't but, know? No, 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 no. If they know him, they call the police. Many times the police catch me and take me off from the tracks and they hit me, kick my ass. The refugees are deported, sent to prison, or if they're lucky, manage to escape Greece and get into more welcoming countries like Sweden or Germany. Mohammed and Aziz also fled to Greece from Afghanistan, but they were caught and sent to a detention center for 18 months. Uh, it's a uh, camp. It's uh, more by the prison, because the prison have some possibility, but there, no. They don't give you good food. They say we cannot. We don't have possibility, nothing, nothing. When they were released, they were given asylum. So all the money you earned when you were interpreters is gone? Believe me, it's down in zero. It's make me crazy many times. We think here, we sleep here. Yeah, how was our life and how is now? 
They now live with three other Afghans in a section of Athens made up predominantly of recent immigrants. This means constant harassment by locals, the police, and members of the far-right Golden Dawn, who blame immigration for Greece's economic woes. They attacked me, the Taliban. They tell me to uh, help them. You are Muslim, you are Pashtun, you must help us. You must give me your car with your card. Because with my card, I go to the camp of Americans with the card. And they told me, we pay for your car and for your card, give us. And I understand they use bats for bad things. Yeah. I, I said I cannot do that. They said, if you don't do that, you will have a problem. Aziz's car with his security pass could have been used for an attack within an American base. This loyalty didn't help him get a visa to the US, but it did make him a target for the Taliban. Of the tens of thousands who have worked for the US in the past decade, there is no evidence that a single one has aided the Taliban in any so-called insider attack. And how do you feel now towards America? Because you, you helped them when they asked for help. If you were in my situation, what do you think? I think my life is finished. No more. They're lads. I request for another Afghan people to so please don't help the Americans. A minority of interpreters, so far less than 30% of those applying, have been granted visas. But often only after extraordinary efforts by American veterans who took an individual case into their own hands. Army veteran Matt Zeller fought years of red tape to bring an Afghan translator to the United States. He says that Janice Shinwari saved his life on the battlefield. The trip to the US was made possible because of Senators John McCain and Jean Shaheen. I met Janice first week I got in Afghanistan. I didn't realize like a week later he'd be saving my life. This mortar round hit and, and I looked at him and I said, brother, I, 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 just, I promise you, I'm gonna do whatever it takes to repay this debt. I'm going to get you to America. Janice's actions made him infamous in Afghanistan and a highly symbolic target for the Taliban. They told to the all Taliban unit, they send my picture, if they see me, in Ghazni city or everywhere, they should kill me. How long did it take to get the visa? Three years. The only reason that he even was eventually given his visa is because we took it to the press and made a stink, and the State Department was looking embarrassed by the fact that they had been sitting on this guy's paperwork for three years without coming to a decision. Matt says the media storm he kicked up can't be replicated, and yet there are still thousands of interpreters who have been waiting even longer than three years to get a visa. Republican Congressman Adam Kinzinger is himself an Air Force veteran of both the Iraq and Afghanistan wars. He's part of a small bipartisan group of senators and congressmen who have come together to improve the legislation for interpreters. When it comes to the folks who do interpreting, who have fought with American soldiers, they may not technically be Americans, but they've put their blood on the lines with their American brothers and sisters in a fight. And so I think we ought to be moving heaven and earth to bring them here too. But still, of the people, of the Afghans applying for a visa, roughly 20% only have actually got the visas. Mm -hmm. Do you know why the number is, is so low? I think some of it is they have to go through um, background checks to ensure that you know, somebody's not using the opportunity to be a translator, to find themselves to come into the United States and cause greater harm uh, along the lines of 9-11 or something like that. But we've never had one single incident of somebody coming over that had been involved with American forces that has turned into a terrorist. Republican, Democrat, left and right agrees that we ought to follow through on our promises. Two months after we filmed this interview, new legislation was proposed, which would expand and improve the SIV program, making it easier for interpreters to get visas. Matt Zeller and the IRAP lawyers were heavily involved in drafting this new legislation. We have foreign nationals who are part of our team, and they need to know that they can rely on us if the situation demands. The work goes on, and with your help, we'll get this legislation through. Thank you. It, it's incremental. It's not enough, but it's a start, yeah. and at least it's something. If this law passes, the number of visas that are going to be available are just going to skyrocket, and this process will be streamlined, and hopefully, you know, within a year's time frame, two years' time frame, we'll have gotten the majority of the folks out of the country. I mean, that's the goal, and that's the standard that I'm going to hold them to. But just a few weeks after the press conference in D.C., 
bickering amongst the Republican House leadership meant that no legislation regarding immigration was introduced. The current program runs out in September of this year, so thousands of interpreters will soon have no chance of getting a visa and will be left to the mercy of the Taliban. La próxima semana, Vice News presenta Metanfetaminas en Filipinas. Viajamos a Manila para conocer el incremento en el consumo y la adicción a las metanfetaminas, conocida como Shabu, e investigamos el tráfico de drogas que existe en la región. Y después, la lucha contra el ébola. Conocemos desde el epicentro de la epidemia en África Occidental cómo se combatió esta enfermedad mortal. Busca más documentales y noticias de todo el mundo en vicenews.com, en el canal de YouTube o la cuenta de Facebook Vice News en Español o en este mismo espacio la próxima semana.